Well, good morning. I'm definitely at closed caption age. I have no idea. What'd you say? You're talking too loud back there. But Becky, tell him to settle down back there. Great to see you guys this morning. And uh, today we're going to talk about this idea of Jesus calling. We're going to look at uh, Luke chapter 5. We continue our series. And today we're going to talk about three ways that Jesus calls us. And um, you know what's funny is we complicate things sometimes. And yet, Jesus made it very clear, and I'm going to read the verse to you. Matthew 10, 42, he says, If anyone gives even a cup of cold water to any one of these little ones who is my disciple, truly I tell you, they will certainly not lose their reward. And the idea is, if you give a, cold, <laughs> cold, if you give a cup of cold water in the name of Christ, it can change somebody's life. Imagine what coffee can do. <laughs> or bacon, yeah, somebody said bacon. So the truth is that one of the things we miss, and it's easy for me to miss, is we're so busy thinking about just serving or just doing or just surviving sometimes or just getting from place to place, we haven't really given thought to the fact that when you do something, Whatever it is, cup of cold water, in the name of Christ, not in your own name, not in your own motivation, but when you really say, Jesus, I want to serve you, it can be the most simple thing, and God can use that, listen, to help somebody find their way home to Christ. And one of the awesome things for me is I was driving in this morning. I have a nice drive through cows and turkeys and all kind of stuff. And as I'm driving, the good news is I'm able to think about a lot of different things. And I was able to think about all the different people who've been baptized over the 13 years at Surfside. All the people who've come to know Christ. People who never went to church and now are not only part of the church, but serve in church or go out of their way to bless others. Paul, I'm sorry, I have to say this before I go any further because I can't, I keep, did you know that UCF won last night? I know your other team didn't, but let's just ignore that, that team with the tomahawk this year and you can root for Miami. So you can come and root for Miami. We'll allow you on the University of Miami team. But anyway, they beat the frogs last night. And they, which is amazing. So anyway, if you're not a UCF fan, you don't care, and it doesn't matter to you. So welcome to Surfside. <laughs> so when I first became a Christian, um, I was a youth, so I was a, a senior. Just right between my junior and senior year, I gave my life to Christ and began serving Him. And actually, that Christmas was about the time uh, of that year. I went to something called Christmas Challenge, and God really began to change me and work in my life. I had always gone to church and done Christian things, but to be honest, I went to youth group because there were girls there, and, and I wasn't thinking about Jesus. I was thinking about girls, and so not that that's rare in the teenage part of life, but, but when I gave my life to Christ, one of the things I recognized is I said, Jesus, I really want to serve you. And so um, I asked the youth pastor, hey, what do you need? And he said, well, we need somebody to set up chairs, somebody to set up sound. So I just would come early on Wednesday nights. I would set up the chairs for youth group. I'd clean up the room, and I would uh, set up their sound system and get things ready. And then when summer came, he said, we want to have a band. And he brought in a guy to lead the music. And, um, I mean, we were playing This Is The Day. That was the, you know... Uh, um, but anyway, so, so um, he brought in somebody to, to lead music, and they wanted me to play drums. And I thought, you know, I've always played drums, secular bands, all kind of things, and for concerts and everything, but I never really did it for church. And I said, well, I can play drums for Jesus. And the first night we were going to play for the youth group, about 10 minutes before youth group, uh, the guy who was leading music yelled at me and uh, I, I got up, I walked out, and I did not come back. And I was, I was, you know, old enough, I was driving, so I just drove off. And so later, I came to youth group near the end, and just came in and sat in the back and, and went through youth group. And uh, later that night, it was like God spoke to me, and people always talk about, you know, how does God speak to you, all that kind of stuff. But, but here's what it sounded like to me. 
Were you playing drums for you or for me? Well, I thought I was playing them for you. Well, then why did you get your feelings hurt when somebody didn't respect you or love you or appreciate you or whatever? And the truth is, I didn't have a good answer because the truth was I was doing it for me as much as I wanted it to be doing it for Jesus when I was tested, when the real thing came where all of a sudden I had to decide, well, this is not making me feel good. I'm out of here. Was I really doing it for Christ? And I believe if you're going to serve Jesus and see him change, by the way, later that night I went back to the guy who yelled at me, by the way, as an adult, I know I was right and he was wrong still (laughs) because he shouldn't have yelled at me. He was old enough to not know better. But guess what? I went and apologized to him for leaving and not coming back. And that was the right thing to do, regardless of whether he was right or wrong. Because the truth is, am I going to serve people or am I going to serve Jesus? And I believe when you go out of your way to serve and do what God wants you to do, I absolutely believe, you ready for this? You're not going to like the first part. It's going to be difficult. There's going to be things, you'll be challenged, you'll be tested, you'll think, I'm the only one who does this. I'm doing so much and nobody else is. But the joy, if you'll persevere through that, if you'll persevere through your selfishness and your self-centeredness that will come up when you serve, God lets you, allows you to bring that selfishness up so you can decide, am I serving a cup of cold water in his name or my name? And let me tell you, sometimes when you serve somebody a cup of cold water, they throw it in your face. But over time, if you say, Jesus, I really want to, if, if, they, if they don't like it, I'm going to continue to do what you've called me to do. I'm going to continue to be faithful. I'm going to continue to do, listen, the little things that matter. And I can look back over the years and see the joy that God has brought not only in my life, but in other people's lives, and, listen, families who are changed. People who I can look back and see what God has done, and even from stories from people like my mom, I can see how God created a heritage because of a few people who picked my mom up from church or went, took her to church, and people who went out of their way to reach out to my grandfather years later, and because God can use you if you'll walk in faith. So I want to look at three things that happen when Jesus calls us. And by the way, if you're a Christian, he's calling you. If you're here today and you're not a Christian, my hope for you is as you listen to this message, you will listen to what Jesus did and you'll say, I want that. And as you see believers who are struggling and sometimes if they're honest, they serve a glass of cold water in their own name and they get frustrated and irritated. But hopefully over time you get to see the real deal of what it looks like when somebody really serves because of their love for Christ. Number one, the call to trust him fully. We're picking up in Luke chapter 5, and I'm going to skip around a little bit at the beginning, and you'll see why. This is talking about Jesus. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon. Simon also called Peter, if you didn't know that. And asked him to put out a little from shore. Then he sat down and taught the people from the boat. Time out. Randy, you're going to love this. This is their amplification system. Jesus said, can you go out so I can have a sound system? There's all these people up there. They can't hear me. I'm having to talk too loud. It's bad for my throat. I guess that's what he, I don't know what he said. But why did he do that? Because we know that your voice carries over the water. So the people could have sat up on the shore. Jesus could have sat off the shore. And so this was his microphone and speaker system. See, you didn't know that was in the Bible. There you go, Randy. There's your verse for the day. Then he sat down and taught the people from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into deep water and let down the nets for a catch. And I love Peter's answer here. He's not Peter yet, but Simon's answer here. He says, Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything. You ever make an excuse right off? 
by the way, have you ever done what I've done, which you said, hey, do you need help with that? And as soon as somebody said yes, you go, oh, well, I worked all night, right? You ever do that one? I've done that one. That's fun. He's like, I don't want to. But then listen to what he says next. And this is what should be true for all of us. But because you say so, I will let down the nets. I'm going to trust you, even though I don't understand. I'm going to work in this situation. I'm going to help in this situation. I'm going to do what I'm called to do, even though there was no fruit when I did it before. I mean, I did that before. I helped before. I helped at church before. I joined a small group. I helped somebody with this, and and nothing happened last time. I was just frustrated and worked hard and sweat, and nobody cared. But guess what? Because you say so, I'll do it. And then it continues... When they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish, their nets began to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boats to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so full, they began to sink. Here's the deal. It caused bigger problems. You ever think about that? Like if you were a fisherman, your boat sinking was an issue. And he caught so many fish that it's like our boat's sinking. Can we get this thing in? Now, here's the deal. When you do what God wants you to do, it's not a worry-free, thought-free existence. We cast our worries on Him, but it doesn't mean that there's no trouble. It doesn't mean there's no trouble. When you help at church, it doesn't mean that everybody goes, Oh, thank you for the glass of water. Some people do this. Oh, you know, you could do better with the water than this. My favorite story is about a guy who, who uh, uh, helped in the nursery and changed a diaper and, and the kid had an extreme nuclear diaper and he handed the kid back to the parent at the end of the night and said, oh, they had a really bad diaper and the parent said, you put their diaper on backwards. Now, if I was that adult, I would have handed them the other diaper and said, you could put this one back on them, but I'm not working in the nursery, obviously. A few verses later at the end of this chapter, this chapter, this is the sandwich on this chapter. After this, Jesus went out and saw a tax collector by the name of Levi, we know him as Matthew, sitting at his tax booth. (laughs) By the way, tax collectors were hated. They were basically spies. They were Jews who had, in many cases, were seen as traitors, which, I mean, have you ever seen an IRS guy show up at your house? Is that a welcome event? Probably not. Anyway, so sitting at the text, he said, follow me, Jesus said to him. And Levi got up, listen, left everything and followed him. Sometimes when you're going to be obedient to Jesus. Well, let me tell you this. Always you have to choose him over everything else. Over your lifestyle. Over the way you've always done things. Over the things that you think are important. Jesus, if you want to call me, I'm going to follow you. And so the idea is he wants us to trust him fully. That's the hard part of the Christian life. And the truth is, this idea of surrender, obviously when you become a Christian, the idea is I surrender my life to you. But as a Christian, if we're honest, there's times that we take it back, right? And we have to say, God, I surrender this area, this thought, this worry, this frustration, this child, this relative, this situation, this frustration. I surrender it to you. When you find yourself flustered and freaked out, that means you're hanging on to it again. And you have to say, I surrender. I leave it behind. Jesus, I trust you. Romans 15, 13 says it this way. May the God of hope fill you with joy. By the way, hope is when things aren't always going well, but you know that God's in charge anyway. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace because as you trust him so that you may overflow with hope. How are you going to do that? By the power of the Holy Spirit. So you walking in the power of the Holy Spirit is what helps you to have hope. It's those moments when you blow it and when you mess up that the Holy Spirit's the one that convicts us of sin. Hey, did you do that for you or did you do it for Jesus? And of righteousness. You know, so-and-so over there needs help. Maybe you should call this person. Maybe you should text this person. Maybe you should check on this person. The Holy Spirit not only convicts us of sin, but of righteousness. He inspires us and encourages us to do what's right. And so when you reach out to somebody and they go, huh, I can't believe you called me today, then you realize that that's the power of the Holy Spirit. Number two, 
the call to endure. I love to hike and I hate to hike. And so I have a simple rule. Is the view worth the hike? And I'm one of these people, if I'm going up and the people are coming down, I will say these words, especially as I get tired, is it worth it? And if they say no, guess what I do? I'm lazy. I just, uh, I told somebody the other day, they said, you know, no, no. I go, hey, you underestimate my laziness. <laughs> is it worth it? And here's the thing. If you do what God wants you to do, there will be times of joy. But there'll also be times of frustration. There'll be things to overcome. It's not like everything is going to go easy. And the truth is, if everything goes easy when you're serving Jesus, you may not be serving Jesus. Because the truth is, life is just hard sometimes. Listen to what happens next. Some men, by the way, this story to me early on, I felt like this is what church should be. Some men came carrying a paralyzed man on a mat and tried to take him into the house to lay before Jesus. When they could not find a way to do this because of the crowd, they went home and we never read this in the Bible. By the way, don't you think there were other people who tried to get their friend to Jesus and said, oh well. But here's what these guys did. They went up on the roof and lowered him on his mat through the tiles. By the way, they did a little digging. That's in one of the other things. They dug through. By the way, one of them got in trouble with his wife when he got home for getting dirty. But that's another story. That's not in the Bible. I'm just making it up. All right, here we go. So they lowered Jesus through the tiles into the middle of the crowd right in front of Jesus. Now listen to what it says next. When Jesus saw, listen, when Jesus, you are trying to help me with the sermon, but you're going to have to wait. When you can come up here if you're going to help. When Jesus saw their faith, it doesn't say his faith. When Jesus saw their faith, which means that these guys are lowering. I have no idea where they found rope. They, they had to find some rope. Their hands are now covered with tar or whatever they use, the pitch on the roof. Jesus looks up and there's guys, four guys. Hey, can you fix this? It says, when Jesus saw their faith, listen to what Jesus says first. He said, friend, your sins are forgiven. The Pharisees and teachers of the law began thinking to themselves, who is this fellow who speaks blasphemy? Who can forgive sins but God alone? Time out. And this is what Luke is trying to show. That's exactly what Jesus is showing. That he is God. He, he wasn't trying to hide it. It wasn't some big secret. It's not like some of my friends who follow another religion say, Jesus never claimed to be God. Well, then who can forgive sins but God? And Jesus is like, yeah, that's the whole point. Now, if you were a friend and you just lowered your friend through the roof and he said your sins are forgiven, wouldn't you look at your other friends like, well, I was hoping for a little better than that. Because the truth is, when we do what God wants us to do, it doesn't always look the way we think it should look. And it doesn't always go the way we think it should go. But what did Jesus know? First, we've got to heal the heart. And then we heal the body. 2 Timothy 2, 3 and 4. Join me in suffering like a good soldier of Jesus Christ, or Christ Jesus. No one serving a soldier as a soldier gets entangled in civilian affairs, but rather tries to please his commanding officer. So, so let me tell you something about being obedient to Jesus. People always do spiritual gifts tests, and there's nothing wrong. Spiritual gifts tests are good, but here's the deal. You should first look... You ready? Ready? This is going to mess up some of your theology. You should first look for... Where there's a need. Why? Because you might be gifted as a teacher. Or you might be gifted as something else. But somebody near you might need their feet washed. Somebody near you might need their yard mowed. And you're not supposed to walk past the yard and go, Well, I'm just going to pray for their yard to somehow get shorter. I mean, spiritual warfare is great. But can I tell you a secret? Physical exercise has value. Some value. Sometimes they, what they need is their yard cut. And so guess what you probably should do? Either cut their yard or find somebody to cut their yard. 
Somebody needs soup. You may be a terrible soup cooker, but I know who to call. Sorry, I didn't mean to point at you. First, look for the needs, and then your spiritual gifts. And listen, eventually God may put both of those together, but the truth is, I was at a church, I'll never forget this. They did spiritual gifts tests. Everybody in the church took a spiritual gifts test, and the nursery was empty the next week because no one had the gift of helping with babies. It's true, absolutely true. And I still remember it, and I remember going, I didn't think that was the point of spiritual gifts test to get out of doing what mattered. And so today, at the end of the service, we in the back have a, have a ministry fair, and there's places you can look. I encourage you, after the service, to at least go back and see who's in charge of different ministries. But even more so to say, where is there a need, and how can I help? Eric, you don't understand. I'm not very good at this. Right now, I am doing concrete for my HOA on top of their wall. Can, can I guarantee you something? There are better concrete people in my neighborhood than me. But guess what? Nobody else stepped up. And so the first thing I got was a note that said, Eric, are you putting that on right? So the pastor wrote back, hey, if you want to put it on, that'd be great. Send. (laughs) Eric, that looks great. Thank you. Send. But let me tell you what else I said. I can take correction without stopping because I'm not doing it for them. And the truth is, when you recognize that you're not doing it for the praise of people, and yes, people may criticize you, ready, doing something for free. But if you're not doing it for them, it doesn't matter. Why? No good deed goes, no, unnoticed. I know it goes unpunished. But no good deed goes unnoticed. Why? Because when you hand out a cup of water in his name, the Bible says you're going to get a reward. The problem is we a lot of times hand it out in our name. So hand it out in his name. Jesus, what do you want me to do? Where do you want me to serve? D.L. Moody says this, faith makes all things possible. Love makes all things easy. Let me tell you something about serving, even when people don't appreciate it. When you really serve for the right reasons, it's joyful. I can look back and see what God has done by some of the simplest things I've done. Sometimes just calling somebody, texting somebody, checking on somebody. Saying to a friend, hey, why don't you reach out to that friend? And I look over the years and I can look back and see how Carrying anybody towards Jesus or help them to find the path to Jesus has helped so many people that it gives me joy. Even on the days where somebody writes me a letter and says, you know you're not doing that right. By the way, somebody came to me one time and said, you know, I don't really like you. This wasn't that long ago. I just want you to know I don't really like you. And here's what I said to them. Yeah, I don't like myself that much either. And I think they were like, well, at least we're on the same page, so, right? Number three, the call to walk in faith. I'll never forget when we first started Surfside, we we ran into some speed bumps, and I called Harold, and I would say, Harold, I don't know where we're going to meet. Harold, I don't know what we're going to do about this. Harold, I don't know what we're going to do about that. We're not set up this yet. We're not doing that. And Harold would just say this, Eric, just keep going. And I'd call him and I'd be like, oh, and he'd go, Eric, just keep going. I was like, it sounds like he's done this before. I felt like Dory. Eric, just keep swimming. And the truth is, sometimes you just have to keep doing what God has called you to do to walk in faith. Look what happens next. Jesus knew what they were thinking and asked, why are you thinking these things in your heart? Which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up and walk? But I want you to know the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the paralyzed man, I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. Immediately he stood up in front of them and took what he had been lying on and went home. Time out. You need to realize this was a huge step for this guy. This guy's way of living was based on his mat because he could sit with his mat and people would throw money on his mat. 
He left his entire lifestyle. He left his entire way of thinking. He left his entire way of doing things. Why? Because Jesus said, get up. And then it says he was praising God. I love this. Everyone was amazed and gave praise to God. They were filled with awe and said, we've seen remarkable things today. By the way, there was another reaction you can read ahead. That wasn't as positive. And let me tell you, sometimes when you do what God wants you to do and you're obedient to him, not everybody's reaction is going to be positive. But once again, you're not doing it for them. You're doing it for him. So when you do that and you see that you have resistance, you should find joy in that because you're like, well, I guess I can't do this for myself because this does not feel good. I got yelled at and I'm just the drummer. And I'm a teenager and this is an adult yelling at me. By the way, I'd love to tell you that I always responded properly after that moment to criticism. But I've had to go back so many times and say, Jesus, I want to do this for you, not me. In Romans 3, 21, it says, But now apart from the law, righteousness of God has been made known to which the law and prophets testify. This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There's no difference between Jew and Gentile. Why? All have sinned. And fall short of the glory of God. So here's what I want you to think about. As we have a ministry fair and we partner together what? To help drag people, carry people to Jesus. See, when my mom was a little girl, my mom and her sister would beg my alcoholic grandfather to come to church. And I know we have all these new apartments here and all these new apartments here and Somewhere in one of those apartments are a few little girls praying that their dad, who's an alcoholic, will come to know Jesus. And so he's going to say to those kids, well, I'll go, but if I don't like anything, I'm leaving. And he shows up for church and they pull into the parking lot because some of you parked away from the front door. They pull right into the front door and the girls say to him, look, Jesus saved you a parking space. The dad comes in the door and says, if anybody mistreats me, I'm out of here. And he comes in the door and one of you greet him and hand him something to hold, which guys love, by the way. And then somebody else says, hey, we got coffee back there for you and maybe even a donut. And the guy says, I'm a vegan and leaves and never comes back. No. <laughs> Goes back and gets a cup of coffee and a donut and he sits in church. And his little girls go next door and now he hears the claims of Christ. And gives his life to Christ. And not only does his life change. His relationship with his little girls change. And God has made him a new person inside. And it didn't happen because of the preacher's preaching. It happened because of all the people who made a way for him to be ready to hear about Jesus. And that's what you do. That's why we have a ministry fair. That's why we partner together so that there can be sound and so there can be video and so that there can be people that watch online and so that we can have somebody watch somebody's kids so that people can make coffee and donuts on the way in so that the building's clean when people show up so that there's parking spaces near the front so that what happens the little girl's dad comes to know Jesus see when my mom first brought brought her dad to church they sat in the front and behind them sat a family that said they're in our seats So my grandfather never went back to that church ever again. And it was years later that he came to know Christ. What if instead he was welcomed and loved and encouraged? What would have changed? Let's help people find their way home. If you're here today and you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, you can do that today. I'll be here after the service. But more importantly, if you're a Christian and you're not serving actively to help people find their way home, I want to encourage you, go and find a spot you can serve. Don't do it for you. Don't do it for me. doesn't bother me a bit. Either way, you do what Christ has called you to do. Give a cup of cold water in his name. Would you join me as we close in prayer? Father, thank you for this time today. I thank you for your word, your love, your power. Lord, I thank you that you empower us to do your will. And Lord, even when we overcome obstacles and things get in the way, Lord, we always want to do what we do for you. Lord, I pray as a church we would continue to help people find their way home to you. 
to grow in you and know your presence. Lord, I thank you for a godly mom who has two pastor sons because of somebody who went out of their way to pick her up for church. Lord, I thank you for all the people who serve here who are making a difference, not just now, but in eternity. Help us to continue to do that, to follow your will. In Jesus' name, amen.